Welcome everyone to episode 16 of the Computomics podcast. We're excited to have you here for this week's discussion on integrating earth observation data into the agricultural value chain. We have just completed a very exciting proposal with Constellar, a company focused on homogenizing and bringing together the various streams of earth observation data. And we will actually have another partner from that consortium on with us in a few episodes, so stay tuned for that. Computomics is always focused on being on the cutting edge of data integration and providing data integration from any autonomous data stream for our customers. So those of you who are struggling with making your data useful, we're always there to help. And we hope you enjoy the episode. So Max, it's nice to have you here. Um, I'm very excited for our audience to get to know you and your company. Maybe you can give us a small introduction to yourself and to what Constellar does. Thank you, Anna. I'm also very excited to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, my name is Max. Uh, I'm the CEO of Constellar. And Constellar's vision is to provide the fundamental data set to optimize water usage in agriculture um, and maybe some other things in the future. Um, we are a relatively young company. Uh, we spin out from um, German Fraunhofer. And uh, we are planning to build a constellation, a constellation of microsatellites to provide this data set. Yeah, so the project that we actually met on and we started working on together is helping to fill and complete the value chain to bring Earth observation data successfully and seamlessly to the agricultural sector. Maybe you can kind of give us a quick overview of that, what that value chain looks like and where Constellar fits inside that value chain. Yes, of course. Um, so it's quite a complex value chain, I would claim. Um, on the one hand side, let's say on the one end of the value chain are those guys providing data, and Constellar will be one of those guys in the near future. Um, so we have companies and organizations like so Airbus, um, obviously Copernicus, the USGS um, on your side of the pond, um, and uh, more and more companies, also commercial companies, which are coming up and selling their data. Um, these companies offer different um, level of services um, uh, Planet, for example, offers nearly everything in the whole value chain, uh, whereas um, other companies do not. For example, Copernicus and USGS usually only offer um, value um, uh, up to a certain data level. So they pre-process the data, but they're not really delivering insights to the end user, which in our case would be the farmer. Then you have a very important intermediate uh, layer, and that's the value-added service providers, as we call them, or BASs. And uh, those companies are the ones which are really taking um, pixel and make them into information or even insights. So they're taking temperature pixels or they're taking visual pixels and then tell by the look of this pixel, tell to the farm, okay, you need to apply more fertilizer, um, less water or whatever else uh, to this pixel. And then obviously uh, we have companies which are um, uh, spanning different parts of this um, uh, value chain. And here in this uh, particular consortium, we have uh, actually a nice chain. Um, we have the, let's say, um, a company and that would be us who is providing data or access to data to different data streams. Um, and then we have a, a value added service provider who's good in um, reading information out of this um, uh, data. That's our, uh, those are our colleagues from Vito. Uh, then we have um, you, Computomics, who is actually feeding these different data streams into their models and then uh, providing insights uh, to the end user. And um, with Radical, we would have an, an end user in that consortium too. So that's how the value chain is looking at the moment. Yes, and uh, hopefully we'll have a conversation with Vito um, as well in a few weeks. Uh, so our audience will have a chance to hear from them in the way that they translate those pixels into agricultural data, which I think is also very fascinating. Uh, maybe just a quick summary of what are the real challenges of homogenizing and bringing this kind of data together? Um, you know, what what caused you to start the company and where do you really see the um, the value that you guys bring and how do you how do you bring that value yeah um so i think there are a couple of things we have to know about earth observation so right now um there are around 2200 satellites um orbiting uh, our planet and about one third of them um is actually doing earth observation so they're actually recording images and these images can then be used in different spectra, can then be used to, um, uh, let's say, derive uh, agricultural insights. Um, from these 600 plus satellites, um, they are distributed over many different providers. And I named a few earlier. 
So we have um, a dozen of silos uh, where data is stored. And one of the big challenges is getting access to the silos. And each and every satellite might have, even if they have similar sensors, might use slightly different bands, uh, uh, might record uh, data in different spectra, um, and is doing things not exactly a standardized way, which also has to do with, with the time they're passing over this place, so different illumination conditions, but also different processing chains, depending on how exactly um, the technology works, which is on board of that satellite. So in the end, um, we have around 100 terabytes of data, which are recorded every single day, and most of this data is not intercompatible. Um, and this is where we see one of the major challenges, that we are recording a whole lot of data, but we're not very good at um, actually using a lot of this data to our benefit. And would you say most of this data is privately owned or publicly owned? Is it held in free repositories or is it for sale somewhere? So my initial guess would be that um, more than 50% of this data is freely available. Uh, the largest and long-lasting archives are those of USGS, and um, since a few years now, also that of, um, of the European counterpart, um, the Copernicus program. But there are other um, organizations, ISRO, for example, um, and so from, from India and others, uh, which are building up repositories of their own. And so still most of this data is, let's say, in institutional hands and can be freely used. However, all of this data has in common that it's not uh, necessarily analytics ready, at least not to a point where we can directly derive insights. And that's where the commercial players come in. So I would say the more valuable data sets are um, here, it, it's moving, the needle is moving more towards the commercial players, whereas in terms of pure wealth of data, um, it's still uh, definitely on the side of institutional um, providers. That's definitely also what we experienced when we began integrating Earth observation data and the process of integrating it for our clients was um, that the meaning of the Earth observation data wasn't yet ready to be translated into insights, surprisingly, on a large scale for sort of mass use. And it's always surprising, but also a wonderful challenge and a wonderful opportunity to get in on a level where um, these things are still under construction. It's like building a new house. You can still install the cabinets that you want and you can still kind of make it work to the way that you uh, you believe it to be a sort of for optimal for consumption. So what are the things that you guys put into FindR, into, into your other products that you think are going to really make it beneficial for the future of integrating Earth observation data into these kinds of sectors? So first of all, I think we have to, to, to answer the question, what is Finder's core purpose? And Finder's core purpose is actually bringing data in an easy way to the end user or to the customer in our case. So making the accessibility or increasing the accessibility of current Earth observation data. Because Finder is going to be the distribution platform of our own data, which will be recorded um, from our own constellation with the first system in orbit already within uh, 14 months from now. So an exciting time for us too. Um, one of the major challenges we, we've seen is that, well, if we'd like to provide a data stream, we have the challenge that maybe we'd like to merge it with other data streams, maybe we complement it uh, with existing data, but this complementation is not very easy. And one of the major obstacles, and that's particularly true for small companies operating in the sector, is that a lot of the time is eaten up by trying to interface different providers and trying to make data workable. So one of the core challenges we are addressing is kind of homogenizing data such that with our partners obviously together, um, this data in the end doesn't matter anymore if it's coming from Airbus, if it's coming from a Sentinel, if it's coming from a Landsat, if it's coming from any, anything else. Um, you simply are looking for data and that's what you should get. And you shouldn't need to care from which provider it is. Um, we, you simply basically choose the data from whatever, um, let's say, requirements you have and not so much from uh, where this data is coming from. And that's one of our core purposes. That sounds incredibly helpful, especially for companies that are that have a small team or a team that's maybe not experienced. I think they can really imagine the fact that they need data that comes in an easy to consume format and is comprehensive, right? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So um, we see it a little bit like at the at the beginning of the uh, the computer revolution. Um, initially, this was a very scientific instrument, and scientists used it. It was difficult to use. Obviously, it had a massive potential. But it was a long way until now. Everybody's carrying at least one computer with them, and it does all these things um, uh, uh, our mobile phones or our uh, uh, well, uh, our mobile devices can do. 
And we don't need to understand the underlying technology. We don't need to understand how chips are working. We don't need to be able to compile things. Uh, we don't need to uh, be able to read assembler to, um, to see how a mobile phone is working. And we hope that at some point, this will be the same case for Earth observation data, that Earth observation data will follow us in our daily lives and we'll have great benefits from it in many different applications. And, um, but again, now coming back to the farmer, the farmer does need to understand how sensors are working, does need to understand and what um, orbit satellites are. For him or her, it's only important that uh, the yield is good and the plants are healthy, and that's what we're trying to help establish a system where it can be used without everybody having to be, uh, having to be an expert on these things. Do you feel like it's a dual challenge when you talk about this information or this product or this concept to people? Do you feel like not only do they not understand the complexity of Earth observation data, but they also don't understand the meaning it will have for them? Or do you think that they kind of I, grasp the, the potential but don't really understand the roadblocks? Where do you see is the difficulty in explaining um, and helping get funding and sort of support for these kinds of services? Usually, uh, to answer the last question first, with the funding agencies, they are usually well aware of the challenges and also of, uh, let's say, the value proposition um, uh, we're offering. So this is not so much the problem. Um, with the customers, it depends. There's the one customer, I would say, um, who's already kind of well-versed in Earth observation data and then also immediately see what the benefits could be. And there's the other one who has a very vague image of Earth observation data. And um, obviously, if we try to address, uh, address both, um, that is, uh, uh, is a challenge, and uh, we also need to do some education. There's the, the little physicist in me, which always likes to educate people how technology works, because he's completely nuts and, uh, uh, and loves technology. But um, uh, that aside, uh, I think, yes, to a certain point, it is important. It is important to say, okay, uh, not in, like in any spy movie, you can't sharpen images as much as you want, and you won't be able to see individual uh, crops or faces or uh, uh, number plates uh, from one image since, since information is simply not there. Um, but I, I don't think that we need to go to this level of really uh, uh, getting a detailed understanding for everybody. That's not necessary for GPS sensors either. Yeah, I definitely resonate with that message and with that wide range of customers and interests. I think that. As scientists who start companies, there's always this transition that happens from wanting to just nerd out on the technology of it to then having to, um, you know, make it seem practical and interesting for people outside of the scientific aspect of it, right? So uh, really bring the value to the person who doesn't necessarily uh, need to know all the details. And that sometimes feels like a rupture with what we love um, as as inner scientists you know it's like what do you mean you don't want to hear about the downsides of you know linear models like you're not interested in all the various aspects of machine learning you just want results but i think that's um that's one of the great things about you know working with other startups and working with other scientists as we sort of make this journey together right we sort of bounce this off of each other, we can talk science to each other and then really deliver the value to the client. And then the client feels this very um, well-backed, scientifically-backed, data-driven product, but they don't necessarily need to invest the time to research it and make it themselves. And I think that's really great. Yeah, I, I can't agree more. Uh, but we have to get over uh, the nerding out part. Uh, sometimes at least, and then, well, every now and then we can still enjoy it. <laughs> like, what are you preparing for a proposal like that? Uh, but in general, yes, that's the idea. So uh, basically make it easy, make it understandable um, in a way which does not involve um, unnecessary scientific paths because, I mean, obviously, well, in principle, I understand how a car is working, but all the intricacies of the car we are owning, I do not understand. I'm also not really willing to understand investing time in that. And it should be the same here. We shouldn't demand uh, that uh, the farmer should uh, invest time in how this, this complex cryo-cooled sensor is working on that satellite because it simply doesn't matter for him. We have to accept that. As we are starting down this road as a society, as, an, as a sector, as a uh, conglomerate of companies, where do you think we will end up or where, where do you think is the ultimate goal? And I know part of the answer will probably be in this solar seamless integration, but maybe one other aspect of that. And the other question I have, you can sort of answer them together is, who would you like to reach out to? What kind of collaboration or what kind of support would you be interested in? And who do you think you would be interested in talking to? Okay, 
so uh, the, the difficulty about this question in agriculture is that about 10 years ago, we thought we'll be way ahead uh, compared to where we are now, well, 10 years ago. Um, and the, the problem is that uh, it was underestimated uh, um, how the use uptake is going to be. When we asked um, a farmer, and one of my co-founders, uh, a dad is a farmer, so um, when we asked him and his colleagues, like, okay, why did you just buy this really expensive John Deere tractor? Um, and it has all this GPS and all this precision farming thing uh, on it. Why did you buy it? And the answer was not because I would like to increase yield, because I believe in the saving of water. Uh, that's all nice and it's also, that's also true, but secondary reason, the, the main answer was because it's freaking awesome. Um, and uh, that is something we also have, have to learn. Um, so, but the good news is we are at this point where things are becoming freaking awesome and maybe 10 years ago they were not awesome enough to be bought. So I believe now that we are at the brink of something which could really change how agriculture is perceived and how agriculture is working. And the um, ironic thing of it is that agriculture is usually seen as one of the most, let's say, underdeveloped sectors. Um, I mean, well, a farmer, yes, you know, people are smiling, it's like, yeah, he's still having his pitchfork and doing this and that and uh, uh, leading the horses on the, I don't know, uh, uh, into the stables and all these things. Um, this seems undeveloped, but the, the truth is that Automated driving, a lot of earth observation, and all these high-tech things are having their foothold and their beachhead market in agriculture. So in terms of this technology, uh, automation and earth observation and space uh, attack in general, agriculture is one of the most advanced markets there is. And I believe that we are now on a, uh, let's say, upward slope, an exponential upward slope, let's say the beginning of the hockey stick. And I hope that in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, because there's also massive external pressure in terms of demographic, uh, uh, demographic uh, pressure, but also climate change and other things, uh, regulations like CAP, the Common Agriculture Policy, which are pushing people into having a massive uptake in agriculture. So um, I believe that the market world we're currently seeing with around 20% in agriculture applications, uh, precision agriculture applications, is going to, um, let's say, uh, solidify and maybe even increase in the future. And I'm hoping that this time, if we look 10, 10 years ahead, we'll really see massive changes. Um, but, uh, well, that's, that's uh, up to be seen. Um, here, in this case, I would like to reach out um, to um, all those companies which are playing with the thought of, well, we'd like to use Earth observation data, we'd like to use this technology because it is the future, just to uh, maybe uh, uh, paint the vision a little bit bigger. We have SDGs, and these SDGs are core, I think, core ideas and core targets we need to follow to live on this planet sustainable, uh, sustainable, in a sustainable way. However, Nearly all of these SDGs come at a global dimension. They are massive. And the only way to answer these global challenges is with a global solution. And uh, currently, global solutions are provided by, at least for half of them, for half of the SDGs, by space assets. So I think Earth observation in particular will play a fundamental role in tackling these SDGs and uh, uh, reaching this goal of living on this planet a little bit further, a little bit longer. So in this case, I would like to urge all the companies which are playing with the thought of maybe we can use space assets, maybe we can use observation data. Um, give us give us a shout. Let us know if you need help. Uh, we are, we are happy to to make uh, to help you and to to let's say guide you on the transition uh, from traditional agriculture to maybe earth observation based or let's say uh, also I mean in your case it's not not only earth observation but let's say to a more scientific agriculture and we believe this is the way forward. So give us a shout. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Max. And I'm really hoping that we continue this collaboration and we continue driving this field forward in a sustainable, data-driven and scientifically backed way. And thank you very much. Thank you everyone for tuning into this episode of the Computomics podcast. I hope you learned something about the importance of the homogenization of earth observation data for the agricultural sector and also for about the possibility and importance of collaboration, collaboration for startups and collaboration in terms of driving the future of innovation. This is something that we really believe in. And if you're interested in getting in touch with us, feel free to. We're always happy to discuss new projects, ideas, or data streams. Thanks a lot and see you next time.